Um, I will be introducing Rebecca Kuznetsky. Rebecca Kuznetsky is a physician scientist. She earned her medical degree from Cleveland Clinic Learn Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University, where she achieved special qualifications in biomedical research. After graduating, she completed her combined res residency in pediatrics and clinical genetics. The subsequent fellowships in clinical biochemical genetics and gen genetics research, all at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Currently, Dr. Gnutsky is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Human Genetics at the University of Pennsylvania, Carolyn School of Medicine, where her interests include mitochondrial disorders, inborn errors of met metabolism, biochemical diagnosis, and nutritional mimics of meta meta metabolic, metabolic disease. She runs a research, a research group focused on understanding complex B deficiency, leads the biochemical fellowships, and is an integral part of met met metabolic training. Dr. Gnetsky is also an attending physician in the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She sees patients with mitochondrial disease and other inborn errors of metabolism with par particular clinical in interest in primary lactic acidosis, mitochondrial liver involvement in disorders of prior metabolism. Well, thank, thank you, Katie, for that extremely kind introduction. Um, and I apologize for the numerous um, difficult words in there. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking to you about um, managing metabolic crisis, except that at the very last minute I, I had a disagreement with my title. So we're going to talk about managing metabolic decompensations today. Um, and the reason that I say that is when I thought about what like the most important thing that I can teach you is, is stay calm. Metabolic decompensations are scary. If you've had one, the first one is always a crisis. There's nothing we can do about that. But after that, um, I think what I want you to take home is it's not a crisis. These are things that most of the time we can manage. And the number one thing that I can do for families, when my families come to me and they say, Dr. Gnetsky made a difference, the difference that they say I made is, you stayed calm while everyone else said, I've never seen labs like this ever before. <laughs> so that's going to be the gift that I'm going to try to give to you and to your home medical teams. Um, please, if I'm going over something uh, this is what I do all day, every day, so it's easy for me to forget that the things that I'm talking about may not be part of your day-to-day -day life. So if I'm talking about something and you're lost and you don't understand what it means, just throw something at me, or if you're too polite to throw things at me, raise your hand so that I know and I can stop and, and explain things. So my goals for this afternoon is to talk about what, what even is a metabolic decompensation? What do we mean when we say that someone's having a metabolic decompensation? Um, will it happen to you or to your kids? How will you know when it's happening? What needs to be done to manage it? And can we prevent crisis? And then my big mission as a physician is to balance protecting kids with mitochondrial disease while letting them also have as much of a normal life as possible. So hopefully we will also talk about that. So we're going to start by talking about what do I mean when I say someone is having a metabolic decompensation? What does that even mean? Um, I'm a metabolic geneticist. And so when I think about metabolic decompensation, I think about values, I think about blood work that is abnormal in mitochondrial disease that is causing symptoms. Those are things like low blood sugar, um, and that's also, sometimes people call that low blood glucose, or a low finger stick, or a low D stick, or a low dextrose. Those are all synonyms for the same thing, which is that the sugar in your blood, which you need to make energy, is now too low. 
When that happens, children can become confused or irritable or have seizures. Sometimes kids don't have any symptoms at all and they look normal, but their sugar is too low. And for sugar in specific, that's still bad. So if low sugar is bad, it means you're not getting enough energy, even when children don't have symptoms from that. Um, acidosis means that there is too much acid in the blood. Usually when we talk about that, we say that the bicarbonate is low, and then we can also say that the bicarb is low, or that there's acidosis, or acidemia, or that the pH is too low, or that the blood gas is abnormal. And all of those things mean the same thing, that you have too much acid in your blood. There's a lot of different reasons why that happens in mitochondrial disease. Some acids that you, all of us sitting here, our bodies naturally produce to make energy. Because children with mitochondrial disease and adults with mitochondrial disease make energy inefficiently, those acids get too high as they're trying to make energy. So those are lactic acid and keto acid or ketone bodies. And then in people with mitochondrial disease, the kidneys, which are supposed to save your important nutrients for you, they are bad at saving the bicarb and they instead pee it out instead of keeping it in your blood where it belongs and that's called renal tubular acidosis. Kids who are having acidosis have symptoms like nausea and poor appetite and poor growth. If it gets really bad, they start doing a very um, abnormal type of fast breathing called Kussmaul breathing where they do these big deep breaths over and over. And if it gets really, really bad, the blood pressure can become too low. Um, calcium can be low. Um, that's called hypocalcemia. And we can also talk about the serum calcium or the ionized calcium. It's all the same thing. That happens most specifically most of the time in Kern-Sayer syndrome, although it does happen in other mitochondrial diseases. And technically, it's not a metabolic emergency. Technically, it's an endocrine emergency. But um, it, it's a small thing that your body needs in order to have normal function. And so I decided that I was going to include it here. Kids who have hypocalcemia can have seizures. Um, and I, you, you might have noticed that I said seizures multiple times now. Um, so if someone has a new seizure and they don't have known epilepsy, these are things that people should be looking for. Um, kids with low calcium can also have poor balance, or they can, even if it gets really bad, have tetany, where they get very, very tight. Um, high ammonia is also called hyperammonemia. Ammonia is um, a small molecule that our bodies make from protein when we're trying to use our protein to make energy. Most people with mitochondrial disease don't have high ammonia all by itself. They have high ammonia because of another problem. Either their body has built up too much acid, and you can't get rid of ammonia when you have too much acid in your body. Or they don't have enough sugar and you need energy to get rid of your ammonia. And when you don't have enough sugar, you don't have the energy to do that. Or the only place where your body does all the steps that it needs to get rid of your ammonia is your liver. And so people with mitochondrial liver disease can have high ammonia. So those are the things that I think about. Um, moving away from small molecules to other things that I think of as a metabolic decompensation is metabolic stroke. And families, and doctors and even mitochondrial doctors have a really hard time with this term because it means lots of different things to lots of different people. The broadest sense of a metabolic stroke is that a person who previously had some neurologic function loses that neurologic function due to an area of the brain acutely, all of a sudden, not working well. Sometimes these are reversible, sometimes they aren't. Um, sometimes this is a cortical problem, so it's a movement or a visual difference. Sometimes it's deeper, so the difference is something like losing um, brainstem function and not being able to breathe independently. People most closely associate metabolic stroke with MELAS, but there's likely kind of different types of metabolic stroke that exist that all get kind of captured under this name. And um, we will come back to that, I promise. Um, and then, um, I think about mito crash, and lots of families tell me, my kid just crashes. What is that? And the answer is, in different families, that means different things. Some kids have mito crash because they're hypoglycemic or because they're acidotic, and other kids have mito crash 
because they've used up all their energy in their body and they're just out of energy. But if I checked all their blood work, I wouldn't see that. So what can it mean? Most of the time, most families will use mitocrash to mean something's happened all of a sudden. I need help. And it happened because of something, whether that's my kid didn't eat enough and they should have, my kid had an infection, or another stressor. And for me, stressors usually mean things like things that take up energy, fevers, um, dehydration, anesthesia, things like that. Might not come with any lab abnormalities, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, it just means that we have to kind of work harder to understand what exactly that is for that child. Okay, so those are the types of crises that we're going to talk about, or decompensations. And then really the question that everyone wants to know is, will a crisis happen to me? And I switched back to crisis this time on purpose, because people don't really care whether or not their child's going to have a decompensation. You care whether or not your child's going to have a crisis, something really bad that you've got to fix. So the first thing to say is, most children with mitochondrial disease most of the time, don't have metabolic decompensation. So um, my other main area of interest is complex five deficiency, and I follow dozens, literally dozens of people with complex five deficiency, and almost none of them ever have a metabolic decompensation, because that's not really part of their mito disease. So most mito patients won't have that. And it doesn't mean, this is a big problem for a lot of my families, a lot of the people come to me say, Dr. Jones says, I don't have mitochondrial disease because my lactate is normal. And I say, well, metabolic decompensation in mitochondrial disease is not a universal feature. And a normal lactate does not mean that you don't have mitochondrial disease. So that's a very important caveat. Um, most patients with mito disease never have a true metabolic crisis. Some do, most don't. Many patients with metabolic disease, mitochondrial disease, will have metabolic abnormalities that are not necessarily dangerous. And this happens to me, again, a lot with lactate, where I will have a patient come in and they will have had a stroke or they will be severely fatigued or um, they will have had a regression where they're not doing something that they're supposed to do. And they'll tell me, the lactic acid has done this to my child. Lactic acid has not done that. The mitochondrial disease has, and it's also raised the lactate. But lactate has a, a really, really, really wide range between normal, which is less than two, and crisis, which in my clinic I generally define as more than 20. And you're... Um, it happens to me literally every week that a Dr. Smith will call me and say, this is the highest lactate I have ever seen in a patient. And I'll say, oh, that's fine. That's not causing them any symptoms at all. They'll say, but it's four. And I'll say, yes. And then we'll stare at each other for a bit. So it's so important because I have kids that I manage and I treat and they do great and we recover neurologic function and their lactate is still four. And that's okay because lactate is not your enemy. Mitochondrial disease is your enemy. How do I know if me or my kid is a kid who's going to have a mitocrisis? So there's some things that you can predict from what the mitodiagnosis is. Um, one of the things I tell people all the time is the best predictor of what's going to happen next is what has already happened. So people who have had a crisis are at risk for decompensating again. Those are the people that I spend a lot of time thinking about. How are we going to make the next decompensation not be a crisis, but be something that we're going to be calm and collected about managing? If you know your molecular cause of mitochondrial disease, some molecular causes are more likely to have crisis than others. So um, I really worry about my kids who have FBXL4 deficiency. They spend a lot of time with really, really high lactates that really, really, really need to be managed. Things like 20. Um, similarly, kids with pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency are at risk for having lactic acidosis. Um, and some types of Lee syndrome or MELAS we talked about are at most risk for having metabolic stroke. So that's another way you can predict whether or not crisis is going to happen. In general, the younger the patient, 
the more likely they are to have a metabolic decompensation in general. It's not a hard and fast rule. I have a patient who is right now a law student and she's not a prodigy, she's, so she's an adult. And she has metabolic decompensation and that's something that's part of her mito. So it depends a little bit on what your mito disease is. But in general, that, that's the association. If you know what organs are involved in your mitochondrial disease, most of your metabolism happens in your liver. And so people who have metabolic, mitochondrial liver disease are at very high risk of having metabolic decompensation. Similarly, we talked about how your kidneys really manage the acid level in your blood. So if you have a lot of kidney involvement, you're at much higher risk of having an acidosis event. People who don't normally have metabolic decompensation at all still can have metabolic decompensation in the wrong situation. What is the wrong situation? The wrong situation is when there's a lot of metabolic stress. Metabolic stress is not emotional stress, although it turns out emotional stress can cause metabolic stress. Um, but when I say stress, what I mostly mean is infection, so things that demand energy. Being infected, usually with a virus, demands energy. And fighting off an infection is often just as bad as getting it. So families will say to me, I mean, Susie wasn't sick at all. She went to daycare and Sammy at daycare was sick, but Susie didn't get it. Why is Susie now having a low blood sugar and really high lactate? And I'll say, well, because her body spent the energy fighting it off. I'm really proud of her for doing that, but she's still going to have to deal with the metabolic consequences of that happening. Um, and the type of infection matters. Viral infections seem to be the most metabolically stressful. We don't totally know why, but that seems to be true. And some types of infection, especially influenza, seem to be more metabolically stressful than others. <clears throat> fever in and of itself. It doesn't really matter why you have a fever. You can have the mildest, tiniest infection, but if it causes a fever, your body has to get energy to raise your body heat from somewhere, and that somewhere is going to cause metabolic stress. Fever is bad. Bringing fever down is good. Surgery, um, both the fasting for surgery and the anesthesia for surgery and the stress of putting your body through it and recovering from it is a stressor. And then anytime that you're not eating as much as you normally are, which often means diarrhea and vomiting. And all people, including totally typical people, younger children have less of a metabolic reserve. They just have less um, stores in their liver, they have less body fat, um, they have more surface area of their body, so they're more prone to getting infections, and so younger children in general are at higher risk. Okay, how do you know that a crisis is happening? Is this a crisis? Things to look for when you are parents at home for a decompensation. Um, you may have heard the medical buzzwords that there's a change in mental status. That means things like children who are really acting different than their normal selves. That can look different for every kid, um, but usually means things like not waking up, acting really confused when they are awake, not being able to do things that you normally can do. Like my kid normally can walk and talk, and now she's not talking. Um, it's normal for metabolic stressors like fever to cause some weirdness. So everyone, even typical people, when they have a fever or they're sick, they feel icky and they act sleepy and they sleep more than usual. That's normal. But if they're not waking up at all or when they are awake, they're just seeming really out of it. That's not typical and that's a concern. Seizures in a kid who doesn't normally have seizures or seizures that are unable to be controlled in a child who normally has seizures that are controllable or controlled by their antiepileptics are a big, big red flag for a decompensation. And then there's different types of abnormal breathing. So we talked about Kussmaul breathing, which is the sign of acidosis. That's that deep, fast, regular, sigh-like breaths. And then high ammonia causes a different type of fast breathing that's an irregular fast breathing. It's often described by families as being picked up like, oh. <gasps> Okay, so your child has metabolic decompensations and someone has handed you a glucose monitor or a ketone monitor or a lactate monitor. What are you supposed to do with it? Um, so 
I, if I haven't said this caveat five times by the time I'm done, I haven't said it enough, I'm gonna tell you general principles. I do not replace having an amazing home team who knows your child. You need one of those, and if you don't have one, you should get one. And if they tell you to do something that is different than what I'm telling you, they're right and I'm wrong. If you have been given a home glucometer, it is going to tell you what your child's blood sugar is, which is great. Generally, if it's less than 70, that's too low and you need to do something. Not everyone has the same normal range, but that's in general a good rule of thumb. Glucometers are really bad at telling you what the blood sugar is when it is less than 70. So if it's low, you don't get to say, well, it's not that low because your machine isn't working anymore. Once you know it's low, it's low, and you have to do whatever it is that you are told to do to fix it. When should you use your home glucose monitor? Depends on the kid. Usually, for my families, I say, don't check all the time because you'll drive everyone crazy. Check when you're worried. So check when there's mental status changes. Check if your kid isn't eating as much as usual. Check if your kid is vomiting. Um, for some kids, it does make sense to check before every meal. Um, for instance, if someone has diabetes or someone really has low blood sugar that's happening on a day-to-day -day life basis, not just when they're stressed. But it, it depends on the kid. Don't drive yourself crazy unless you have to. Um, someone gave you a ketone monitor. That's sometimes really scary for families because blood sugar monitors are more normal. You, you know, you're grandma or grandpa might have a blood sugar monitor to check for their diabetes, but you probably don't know many people who have a home ketone monitor. Um, ketone monitors measure ketones. Ketones are an acid that your body produces when it's trying to make extra energy for you. Some kids with mitochondrial disease either produce ketones because they need more energy than they can get from sugar. Some kids with mitochondrial disease don't produce extra ketones, but they're really bad at getting rid of them once they've made them so they can still go really high. The ketone monitor tells you how high the ketone level is. Um, normal is usually, depending on your machine, less than two. Some machines, it's normal is less than one. But it normally varies throughout the day. So if I took everyone in this room right now and I said, check your ketones 12 times in the next 24 hours, all of us will be high, probably higher than normal when we wake up in the morning because we needed to make extra energy from fat while we were sleeping because we weren't eating when we were sleeping unless you sleep different than I do. And as we eat throughout the day, they go down. And that's normal. Um, ketones come from a lot of different places. So in some kids, as long as they're at their baseline, you know, I have some kids who live at five, and that's okay, as long as they're like always at five. But when they're five and a half or six, then that's not okay. In other kids, Ketones aren't okay and always need a response. So um, I have kids with Crohn's Sayer who have diabetes. When you have diabetes, diabetic ketoacidosis is never okay. That's a sign that you're really out of control and you don't have enough insulin. And that always needs some sort of response, whether that response is insulin or insulin plus meal. Um, but often what I'm looking for when I'm looking at ketones is whether or not the ketones are going up or down. So my kids wake up in the morning and their ketones are three. Is that normal? No, but that's okay. And they're going to eat some food and I want that level to go down. But if it's not going down and it starts going up, that's a sign that they're not making enough energy for their body and we need to do a thing. Is that thing going to the hospital? Um, I have families who are very much all over the spectrum on being in the hospital. Um, but most of my families say, look, we like you, but we don't like seeing you. How can we avoid seeing you as much as humanly possible? <laughs> so, first of all, don't triage alone. You need a home team to decide whether or not you should panic. No one can tell you whether or not to panic unless they know you and your kid. So find that buddy. They're so, so, so important. Um, I have families where I'm their buddy because they live in Philadelphia. And that's actually really great and relaxing for me, but that most of my kids don't live in Philadelphia. So I have families who have a neurologist buddy, and that neurologist isn't a metabolist, but they've gotten to know that kid really well, and they've gotten to know what signs of crisis are for that kid really well. And so the family calls them. I have families who have a local geneticist. I have families who have a local pediatrician. It really doesn't matter what that person's background is, as long as they are 
medical, are willing to talk to you or have a call structure of someone who will talk to you, um, and who are willing to get to know you and your family and your kid and learn what normal is for you and your family and your kid. Because there is absolutely no mito child in the world where they are the same as another mito child in the world. Um, in general, signs that medical attention really has to happen and no, you can't do this at home are a child who's having mental status changes. If a child is not, not doing things that they used to do, or they're not waking up, or they're confused, that's a really concerning sign that there's something potentially treatable going on, like a stroke, like low blood sugar, um, like acidosis, like high ammonia, all these things can cause mental status changes. But those are things that are all fixable, but they're only fixable if you act fast. So those are times you have to go in. Blood sugar less than 70 and not coming up with a home plan. So most families who check blood sugar pretty regularly have a home plan of what you do when the blood sugar is low at home. Um, so you do your home plan and your blood sugar is still less than 70. And you're like, well, it's not that much less than 70. If it's still less than 70, your machine isn't very accurate. You have to go in to figure out what it actually is and see whether or not you need IV sugar. Do you have to stay? Maybe not, but you, you at least have to go in. Abnormal breathing, like the deep breathing that we talked about, especially if it seems like someone is struggling to breathe or the breathing's becoming really heavy, is a time that almost everyone needs to go in. Um, acute changes in what someone neurologically does. So if it's normal that your child's right side is a little bit weaker than their left side, but now it's much weaker, or it's normal that your child's right side is a little bit weaker, but now they're both weak, anything that's a new neurologic finding needs to be seen because we need to ask the question of whether or not it's a stroke. Or none of these things are happening, but something's off and you've tried the things you normally try at home and they're not helping and things are overall getting worse instead of better. That is almost always a time to come in. What do you expect to happen next when you go to the hospital? And this is one of the things um, that's some of my families really struggle with, especially if the first time they got diagnosed with mito was a crisis. And then they say, do I have to do this all over again? Usually what I say is no, getting diagnosed is the worst day of your life because you also don't know what's happening and everything is going crazy. After that, it's just a decompensation and we're gonna get it under control as best as we possibly can, but at least we know what's going on. So we should check vital signs. Um, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. If the respiratory rate is very high or the blood pressure is very low, those are critical indications. So signs that this is not just a decompensation, but really a crisis that we need to intervene on quickly to, to get a child safe. And then um, decompensation labs. What is the blood sugar? What is the lactate? What is the blood glass? What are People will call it either the basic metabolic panel or the complete metabolic panel or the hepatic function panel or the renal function panel or the CHEM7, there's like 3,000 names, but it means electrolytes. And what is the liver function? Why do we ask these questions first? These are the things that we can treat. Being able to check the things that we can reverse quickly is how we keep your child safe. People ask me about other emergency labs Yes, it's nice to get metabolic labs and someone's decompensating, especially if someone's not diagnosed or we don't totally know the reason for the decompensation. That's very helpful to see what the metabolic state is, but it's not an emergency. And we shouldn't sacrifice getting the things that will tell us what we need to do to keep your kids safe in order to get those things. How high is too high? Um, so when I was an intern, one of my senior residents said this to me, don't panic alone. And it was the best advice I've ever had. So don't panic alone. Have a medical buddy who knows what normal is for your kid. Um, because there's not really such a thing as globally too high or globally too low. Um, I, I wasn't kidding. I really had four children last week, all of whom had a lactate of 11. And each time, 
their physician called me and said, this is the highest lactate I've ever seen in my entire life and I don't know what to do. And I said, it's okay. This child is okay. This is where they can live. I know what to do and I can get it under control. So you need that person. They don't have to have ever seen it before your kid, but they have to be willing to not panic now. Um, an emergency room letter is a good idea. It will tell other doctors, this is Johnny. Johnny's lactate is normally 11. This is what we do when Johnny is acidotic. Johnny's glucose is best at 80 or whatever it is for Johnny. Um, emergency room letters do not replace medical management in the moment. They are designed to introduce the emergency room doctor to your child to help them get your child safe and under control until their care can be taken over by a primary medical, medical team. Um, so how high is too high part two? So lactate. Normal lactate is less than two. Um, if you go to Quest or some other hospitals in the country, they give you lactate in milligrams instead of millimoles and the normal is less than 22. So if my numbers for lactate seem ridiculously low to you, just multiply them all by 10 as I talk. Um, lactate is not toxic. Lactate is not toxic. Most doctors are very scared of lactate because things that make lactate go high are bad. But lactate is just a sign that badness is happening. It is not toxic itself. It is an acid, and so it will cause acidosis, and you have to fix that. But that's easy to fix. Acidosis usually happens with lactates greater than 5. When you worry about lactate, you worry about it being an acid. Um, and so that goes hand in hand with what should my bicarb be? Bicarb is the main base in your cell. So when it's normal or high, you don't have acidosis. And when it's low, you do have acidosis. Normal is greater than 22. I usually consider anything greater than 16 to be safe. Is it ideal? No, but it's safe. If you always live less than 16, eventually, that can cause some symptoms. So one of the symptoms is poor appetite. One of the symptoms is poor growth. Sometimes kids have nausea when they live consistently under, um, you know, 22, between 16 and 22. But it's okay. It's not a crisis. If your bicarb is in the single digits, that is a crisis. And that's something that has to get fixed right away because it can cause low blood pressure and it can cause heart rhythm abnormalities. And those can be life-threatening. So that's a time to panic. Um, luckily, it's easy to fix bicarb most of the time. And you do that by giving bicarb. Um, in some cases, there's so much acid that you really struggle. So I said, you know, I do really worry about kids where I can't consistently get their lactate below 20. And I honestly really worry if I can't get someone's lactate below 15, that that's going to mean that I have to give them so much bicarb to get their bicarb level normal that they aren't going to be able to tolerate it very well. Um, but most of the time, you give bicarb and you fix the problem. Normal ammonia is less than 47. It varies a few numbers in one direction or another from hospital to hospital. So some hospitals may have less than 50 as their normal, some may have less than 35, but you know, somewhere in there. It's very hard to draw correctly. You have to draw it on a free floated, flowing blood sample and you have to send it on ice. Many hospitals are not good at doing that. <laughs> and so then it gets really high. Um, the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me is I had a child who had a blood ammonia level of 350 and I panicked and I was very, very worried and I told them that their child was critically ill and I put the child in a helicopter and I flew them um, three hours of ground time to CHOP. And then the first lactate that we drew at CHOP was 10. And then I told them that their baby was normal and healthy and they could go home, but they took a helicopter to get there and that was really hard. And I was very, very embarrassed. So don't be me. Don't panic if the ammonia is high. Recheck it unless you know that your child has high ammonia regularly as part of their condition, in which case we should worry more. In general, if it's greater than 100, that's an emergency that's causing mental status.
problems. And ammonia, alone among these parameters that we're going to talk about, the longer your ammonia is high, the more long-term damage you are doing to the brain. So it, it's something that really needs to be respected and taken very seriously. Most abnormal ammonia in kids with mitochondrial disease is a sign that the liver isn't working very well. Um, and so that's something to think about. And um, when I think about that, that leads me into the question of what else could this be? I think my kid is having a crisis. What, we've treated the numbers. We've fixed the ammonia, we fixed the bicarb, we fixed the sugar. Can we be done now? We cannot. So spend a lot of time thinking about the liver. The liver is one of the most metabolically active organs. And so if kids are really biochemically abnormal, I really worry that their liver isn't okay. Liver dysfunction is something that a lot of you are probably familiar with when people measure ALT and AST because it's easy to measure. <laughs> Less commonly talked about is liver failure, where the things that your liver is supposed to make for you, like the factors that help clot your blood, like the albumin that your body needs for nutrition, it is doing a bad job making, and that's called liver failure. And that's way more of an emergency than liver dysfunction. Um, I think about the kidney. The kidney filters out bad things and saves good things for you. So when someone has acidosis, I think about whether or not they have renal tubular acidosis. And then I think about what could have caused this to happen. Could it be the Epstein-Barr virus, which is mononucleosis? Could it be another infection like influenza? Could it be a mitochondrial toxic drug? And then I think about normal kid stuff. And this is all normal kid stuff that has happened to my mito patients that I forgot about because I was so busy treating them as a mito patient that I forgot to treat them like they were a kid. So children get into adult medication. Things like metformin can look like mitochondrial disease. Things like too much aspirin can look like a metabolic decompensation, mitochondrial disease. We should think about those things. Um, kids with mitochondrial disease get appendicitis. So I got called by the emergency room once and they said, your kid's here, he's vomiting, he has acidosis, we fixed his bicarb and he's gonna be admitted to your service now. And I said, wait a second, didn't you just say that he's vomiting and his right lower quadrant hurts? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's part of his acidosis. And I was like, but wh wh why the right side? And then I said, did you examine him? And they were like, no. I said, can you examine him? And he had appendicitis. And I did not want a child with acute appendicitis sitting there getting managed for his metabolic numbers. I wanted him in the operating room getting his appendix taken out. Your children are children. They do all the normal children stuff. Don't forget that. I've also seen three broken bones, two arms and a leg, that people thought were mitochondrial decompensation because kids weren't moving like they normally do. But it was because they fell and they broke something. So those are other things to worry about. OK. So now we're having a metabolic decompensation. Um, what should we do about it? You need a home team. If I had, I cannot say this too many times. You need one. Um, because they need to answer questions like, is that dose right? The pharmacist says, I've never used a dose like this before. Because the pharmacist has never met your mitochondrial disease patient. But also, we do math wrong sometimes. So they should know what the right normal dose for you is. Um, most meds have their FDA label for other uses, things that are not mitochondrial disease. And so we're going to use weird doses, weird routes, and weird schedules. So people are like, I only use that medication you know, three times, and you're using it twice a day. Yeah, that, that turns out to be right for mito. But you need someone who is your friend who will talk to the pharmacist and tell them, yes, this is the right plan. This is how we manage my child's mito disease. Um, I get questions all the time about what IV fluids should be used for my child. What are the choices? How much dextrose tells you how much sugar is how many calories in the fluid? Um, people talk about whether to use amino acids, which are also called TPN or PPN, and when to use fats, which are intralipids or IL. How much salt to use, whether or not there should be bicarb in the fluids, how fast you should give the fluids. That's a lot of questions, and most of the time it's really dependent on the situation. But I'll at least answer the dexterous question. Some kids need very low dextrose. So typical kids, 
get 5% dextrose. So 5% of their IV fluids going into their veins are sugar. Some mito kids need less than 5%. Why? Um, kids who are stabilized on the ketogenic diet should not have sugar in their IV fluids. Period. Um, unless there's a strong extenuating reason. Most of the time, it's, it would be very bad because coming out of ketosis can cause seizures. Other kids with severe lactic acidosis, and again, I'm, I'm talking about really severe lactic acidosis, lactates that are 10, 15, 20, and you're really having trouble getting them out of acidosis. So that's the main concern that you have right now. They're making the lactate because they're trying to make energy. The more sugar you give them to make energy, the more they will make energy, which is good, but the more lactate they'll make in the process, which is bad. Some kids need very high dextrose, and by very high, I mean 10% or more. Who are those kids? Those are kids who have had low blood sugar in the past, or who have signs of muscle breakdown, which is called the high CK. Most of my families come to me very, very, very stressed out about which IV fluids have been used. And I have families who come and they say, they used D10, and my kid's lactate was four, and it went up to five. And I read on the internet that that's wrong. And other families will say to me, they use D5, and my kid has mito, and the internet says they need D10. And this is really concerning, because it's a sign to families about whether or not their teams understand mitochondrial disease. But for most of the kids, most of the time, once you've given some amount of dextrose, between 5 and 10%, most reasonable numbers are okay. It turns out that the difference between 5 and 10% dextrose at the rates that we give most kids is about the amount of sugar in a handful of M&Ms, or maybe a little bit less. It's really not a substantial difference. So I want to remove that as a source of stress from your life. Trust your team, if, if you have one. It's important that your child gets dextrose. Exactly how much? Most of the time, doesn't really matter that much. If your child's blood sugar is low, usually what they're going to do is some ridiculously high number, like D50, but they're only giving a teeny tiny amount of it, because what they need right then in that moment in time is sugar, and then they'll give a normal maintenance glucose between 5 and 10%. But I just want to say that that number will be really, 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 really high for the first bolus, and you shouldn't panic. That's normal. Should there be bicarb in the fluids? Um, there is a mathematical equation for how much bicarb. This usually means they should get a big amount now and then a smaller amount over time. Um, some families get really, really worried because they're like, I came in and the bicarb was 10. That's half of what it should be. And then they fixed it, but it only went up to 15. That is actually the point. Doctors forget to tell you that that's the point, but it's actually safest to fix half in the first hour and take 24 hours to fix the rest. So don't panic, that's normal. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then this is a really big source of stress in my clinic. The pharmacist said normal is one to two milliequivalents per kilo. And you just told me that I should give a lot more than that. Yes, your mito child makes more acid than typical children. So they need more than the typical dose. This is still a good time to take a gut check for arithmetic errors. If they're, you know, normal's 22 and they're 20, and I just told them to give 10 milliequivalents per kilo, that's wrong. But if normal's 22 and they're 2, and I said to give like 10 milliequivalents per kilo, that's probably right. What about those ammonia drugs? That comes up a lot. Okay, should my child get lactulose? Probably not. It's only helpful to lower ammonia in liver failure. So if your kid has liver failure, they should have lactulose. But if they don't, it's not going to help lower the ammonia. Um, and it might have other side effects, so it's really not worth trying, which comes up a lot. Other drugs, like aminol, which you may have heard of, do lower ammonia from metabolic causes, but they don't work in liver failure. So you kind of have to make a decision about what we think the ammonia is coming from. It's okay to be wrong, as long as you have a plan for how you're going to know that you're wrong and make the next steps to fix it and have the child under control. Both bicarb and aminol have sodium. Too much sodium is bad for you. 
So sometimes we have to make decisions about what we're going to do and what's the most important first priority so we can keep the sodium in a safe range. There are other medications you can use for a crisis. Um, I really like to use N-acetylcysteine. It's an antioxidant that goes straight to the liver. Um, antioxidants are kind of the core component of the mitochondrial cocktail. It can be used for acute liver dysfunction, and it may also be helpful for the type of metabolic stroke that happens in Lee syndrome. Um, arginine is a nitric oxide donor. Nitric oxide is a normal chemical that we make in our bodies that keeps our blood vessels nice and open so that blood can flow. Um, arginine is really helpful for mitostroke, especially the type of stroke that happens in MELOS. Other specific therapies exist, and I said gene-specific therapies, I don't mean gene therapy here, I mean therapies that are based on our understanding of what your specific gene does. Um, more sources of stress. My child is having a crisis and no one is giving them their cocktail. Cocktails can't be given IV. Some components can, but the overall cocktail can't. Some components may be useful to increase in some acute situations, but most of the time, the mitochondrial cocktail is a set of supplements that are rationally chosen to increase the amount of energy that your child can produce, but won't acutely change a decompensation situation. And so it's okay to prioritize other drugs and other management in a crisis situation. Can decompensation be prevented? Uh, prevent viruses, but have a life. Good hand hygiene, avoid sick contacts, but your kids can't avoid other kids forever. It's not good for them. So I usually tell my families, if you never regret going to that birthday party, you aren't going to enough birthday parties. I don't want it to be a crisis, but it's okay. Your kids should be allowed to go on a play date and then have a little bit of a decompensation and then we have to manage them. But you need to let your kid have a life. Fever. For most mito kids, most of the time, Tylenol and ibuprofen are safer than fever. Yes, both Tylenol and ibuprofen are bad for mito cells in culture, but that doesn't mean that they're bad for mito kids. If your kid has liver dysfunction, Tylenol might not be okay, and then talk to your doctor. Your goal is to keep a temperature below 101, below 100.4 under six months. Um, it's okay to treat higher things, like 99, but overall, the, the height of the fever does correlate with the degree of stress. Vaccines are good. They save lives. Most medical kids tolerate vaccines. Most kids can tolerate vaccines more than they can tolerate vaccine-preventable illness. You want to vaccinate your children when they are well. You want to treat fevers, usually starting 30 minutes before the vaccine and continue for 24 hours and encourage eating and drinking post-vaccines. It's okay if they're a little bit sleepy or less energetic for up to 24 hours after a vaccine. If they really don't tolerate vaccines, your kid had a regression or a metabolic decompensation with vaccinations, it's still important to get vaccines. They're even more at risk of crisis with vaccine-preventable illness than other mito kids. So make sure all the precautions we talked about are taken. Think about whether or not they should be admitted to the hospital and given IV fluids while they're going to be getting their vaccines. And if the vaccine absolutely can't be done safely, it's important to get herd immunity and make sure that everyone around them is vaccinated. Families come to me and they say, I shouldn't have let this happen. It's okay. You are your child's best advocate. You are the only person who really can advocate for your child as a whole human being. You are a critical part of their care. You cannot prevent every decompensation. It's normal to regret that you let them go to daycare at that birthday party. But it's your job to make space for your mito kid to have a normal life. And it's my job to work with you to make sure that we keep decompensations under control when they happen as part of normal life. That is what I have for you. Um, and I think we have about seven-ish minutes for questions. Thank you. I I've been coming to these things for 12 years, and this has like been one of the most helpful sessions ever, so thank you. Thank you. Um, can you explain non-ketotic hypoglycemia? I know hypoglycemia is when you have low blood sugar and probably no ketones present. Yeah, this is such an important and good question, and I swear you're not a plant, um, but uh, come see me and I'll give you some candy later. 
Um, sure. Non-ketotic hypo... So ketones are an energy source that your body makes. It's an energy source that it makes as an alternative to sugar. All of us, when our sugar goes low, our ketones should go high in order to provide energy to your heart and brain instead of sugar. Non-ketotic hypoglycemia is when your body is not good enough at producing ketones, so it is not responding to hypoglycemia normally. It is much more concerning than ketotic hypoglycemia, and it happens to some mito patients because their bodies are not good at making ketones or they're not good at breaking down fat for energy. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was very, very helpful. Um, just a question about an emergency situation with the IV fluids. So in terms of like the lactated ringers, is that always a bad thing or should, like for emergency yeah. teams, should we be careful to tell them not to give that? That is a great question. And it's something that we actually are struggling a lot with right now. Um, lactated ringers is a type of IV fluids that have existed for a really long time. But new research is showing that lactated ringers may be helpful for kids who are having shock, typical kids who are having shock, and so hospitals are using them more. Lactated ringers contains lactate. For kids with mitochondrial disease, it will make the lactate go up. For kids with severe lactic acidosis, this is bad, and I like to avoid it. For kids who do not have severe lactic acidosis but might live with a lactate of 2 or 3, um, we're not sure right now whether the benefits of lactated ringers being a good and more normal fluid than normal saline is better, or whether the lactate going up is worse. Um, and so right now what I'm telling families is, if children have a severe lactic acidosis, you should avoid lactated ringers. Otherwise, the team should consider the risks and benefits of lactated ringers carefully, but it's not absolutely contraindicated. So as a MELOS patient, as you mentioned the arginine therapy. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you um, do that um, intravenously or would you do that in a central line? And how many uh, weeks could you do yeah. it for? So that's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm going to repeat the question just in case anyone in the room couldn't hear. So the question was, for patients, especially patients with me loss, how do you give arginine and for how many days? Um, and the answer is I do give arginine through a peripheral IV, although if someone has a central line, you can also give it that way. Um, I give, uh, the pediatric dosing for arginine is 500 milligrams per kilogram, IV over 90 minutes. And then I repeat it every 24 hours for between three and five days. Um, if someone's getting better from the arginine, and they got better on day four, and they got better on day five, I'm going to give them a sixth day, and I'm just going to keep going until they stop getting better in response. Um, but in general, I usually see most of my response within the first 24 hours, and I kind of go until I stop seeing them get much better, which is usually about three days. Do you have any issue with burning the vein? With I have not had issues of... Um, of vein burning or getting um, uh, uh, phlebitis with giving arginine through a peripheral IV. The side effects of arginine um, that are reported are um, acidosis, uh, low blood sugar, low blood pressure, um, and headache. Uh, we published a paper out of CHOP on our experience using arginine in kids, and we actually saw no side effects in any of our patients who received it, including no IV access issues. Yes? How can you tell if a patient is how can you tell if a patient is having a metabolic stroke? Because it doesn't really show on imaging. Yeah. So this is a, the a really big challenge. Some metabolic strokes will show up on imaging, but a lot of times they either won't or they'll have resolved with arginine by the time you get imaging or you need careful imaging to do it. Um, right now, in general, for most children, I treat with arginine first and worry about whether or not it was actually a metabolic stroke later. Is that right? 
Scientifically, no, it's wrong. But medically, when you have someone in front of you who's having a neurologic event that you think might be treatable, um, treating first and asking questions later feels like the most um, medical decision to make. So, so that is, that's what I tend to do. Um, some institutions are now developing rapid targeted MRI scans to try to rapidly determine whether or not someone's having a metabolic stroke. So stay tuned. Uh, my hope is that that will be successful and we'll be able to roll that out on a larger scale. Um, but, but for right now, I, I worry about it later. There's someone all the way in the back. Oh, and this gentleman here has had his hand up for a really long time. I just wanted to show the fever slide again. I didn't yeah. catch all the information on that one before you would pass it. Okay. No worries. Um, this is a continuation of the question. Um, you, let's say you get the MRI within the first 24 hours, it's clean, but you still have a neurological de um, deficit. Do we call it a metabolic like stroke? So that's a really good question, and it depends on the situation. Um, so the question is, if you have a neurologic decompensation, the MRI is totally clean. So the questions to ask are, is the MRI totally, totally clean, um, or is, is it possible that something subtle could be there? And that's the importance of having a pediatric neuroradiologist, which I know is a privilege that I have and not everyone has. Um, the other question is, how, what was the prior probability before you got the MRI of a mito or metabolic stroke? And so you know, if you have some, my answer is very different. If you have someone with me loss who's had strokes before and you got a limited MRI with some movement at an institution that doesn't have a pediatric neuroradiologist, I would definitely treat that. If you have someone who has a disease that doesn't usually associate with metabolic stroke, the MRI is completely clean and it's been read by like one of my neuroradiology experts, I would start looking for another reason for that neurologic decompensation. And then probably most real life cases live somewhere in the middle of that. Okay. Um, I think that's time. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganeski. Um